Ladies and gentlemen, it's three o'clock and we need to start our legal committee meeting. He's well, going to need to use that, that. Where are they coming in and out at? They're coming in and out right on the foundation. Okay. Then, then he'll take a wire. You, take, you, you build. Oh, it's 3 o'clock. I'll talk to you about it later. But, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you how to do it. You can actually watch it on YouTube and do it yourself. Either. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Miss Counselor, Counselor Stubbs, I, I, I'm ready. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate those of you that are here. This is the meeting of the city council. Why is all this here? Is this, are these yours? Why'd you give them to me? You put them in front of me. You did a good job of it. Um, I'm sorry, folks, I've been doing a few different things. Um, like I say, this is the uh, Thursday, July 22nd legal committee meeting of the Roswell uh, City Council. Uh, let's call it to order. And um, if we could have roll call, please. Councilor Stubbs. Here. Councilor Peterson. Who is no longer a member of the committee. Councilor Perry. Here. And Councilor Foster. Here. Great, so we have a quorum of, uh, of three people. Uh, Councillor Peterson has um, resigned from the council, I think, as of yesterday. And so uh, when that position is filled uh, by, by an appointment of the mayor and confirmation of the council, he will join, he or she will join this, this group. So thank you all for being here. I don't know why everybody looks so far away, and there's so few of you. I'm glad because you look so far away. Um, could we also have an approval of the, the agenda today, please? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the agenda for July 22nd as presented. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and second to approve the agenda. Is there any further discussion, questions, or comments? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. We'll go with the agenda as is. Uh, we have the minutes of uh, our last month's meeting, Thursday, June 24th. Any questions, comments, changes, recommendations? Then they'll stand approved as, as written. Thank you all. Um, we have actually three items on the agenda. Our first item is uh, a resolution with the mayor for the mayor's um, grant authority for the Roswell Air Center. Mr. Stark. Welcome. Afternoon, counselors. I'll make this really quick. This is a housekeeping item that we do every year uh, for the FAA grants that, that uh, we apply for and receive. Um, it allows the mayor, the governing bodies, um, permission authority to uh, sign those grants and accept them and I'll stand for any questions okay can I right off the bat do some wordsmithing mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just I just think in the title of this this resolution it wouldn't hurt to say Roswell comma New Mexico um, since it's going to the Fed and um, in the first whereas, the second line uh, where it says FAA for a grant. And then the last line adopted, signed, and approved this 22nd day of, oh, wait a minute, is that right? No. It's okay the way it is. No. It's not no. Twelfth. That's what it. Okay. Sorry. It's the twelfth instead of the fourteenth day of August. Okay. It's the twelfth. Okay. Okay. Small changes. So to address the the first question on a grant versus where is. So this just to be clear, this would allow multiple grants to be approved uh, 
by the mayor, and that's the way it was written that way. So, oh, okay. If that still makes sense, that's fine. I just want well, to point no, that out. Well, let's, no, let's say for grants, then let's let make the okay. grants plural instead of the A. Perfect. Okay. That just didn't sound right to me for grant. I understand. It didn't to me either, and that's why I changed it. So, okay. But I like, I like that version. So, let's, okay, let's keep our options open, huh? Okay, yep. And let's say for grants with an S. Okay. Um, anything, Scott? Anything else? That's all I have. Any comments? Okay. Any questions of Scott or questions about the resolution? Can I have a motion? I to go with Madam the Chair, I make a motion that we send this resolution a. authorizing the mayor of the city of Roswell, New Mexico to accept funding assistance from the Federal Aviation Administration on behalf of the city of Roswell. Um, uh, with the with the correction of grants being made plural in the first word as and adopted and signed and approved on this 12th day of August 2021 send a full council we have a motion and a second to uh, recommend approval to full council on the consent agenda Councilor Perry yes ma'am okay on the consent agenda um, the resolution any other questions or comments? The resolution with those few changes. Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of the resolution authorizing the mayor to accept funding assistance from the FAA, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. That will go to full council on the consent agenda. Next, we have um, the uh, city managers authorization to request this one also is a housekeeping item and it is the sister to the other one uh, this uh, this authorizes the city manager to sign for multiple grants that are offered to us by the state of New Mexico Department of Transportation Aviation Division thank you are there any questions or comments um, on this resolution I would offer that this uh, also needs to be adopted signed and approved on the 12th day of August instead of the 14th ready for a motion I'm ready uh, madam chair I make a motion that we send a full council on the consent agenda on the next City Council meeting uh, the following resolution authorizing the city manager to apply for accept and execute grant agreements for funding assistance from the state of new mexico aviation division on behalf of the city of roswell for project development at the roswell international air center with the one correction of the adopted signed and approved on this 12th day of august 2021. okay we have a motion and a second any further discussion all right hearing nothing and you did say consent this time. Did you say consent agenda? Consent agenda, agenda yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, again, hear, hearing no more comments, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, aye. same sign. Motion carries. I'm Thank sorry, you. I'm just bleh today. Nothing terribly new, I understand. But Okay, so next. Um, let me give a little bit of background if I can. We're on uh, Ordinance 21-09, which is our cannabis ordinance. Um, I want to say how appreciative I am to uh, Kevin Mabers and uh, Spencer's back here and our city attorney and assistant attorney and the chairs of the finance and, oh, interesting, you're right here the Finance Committee and the Public Service Committee, which are also on this committee, um, for uh, taking the time that we have to, um, to look at this issue of uh, cannabis in relation to the new um, act. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin right now to give us some background, uh, but may I also state for the record that um, since the uh, publishing of this agenda, uh, we have been to a, um, I guess it was a Zoom meeting held by the New Mexico Municipal League and the superintendent of the um, 
regulations and licensing, I guess, division with the state. So we have made some proposed changes in a result of those dis discussions. So um, I think at this time, if legal agrees with me that I'd like to propose that that's the copy that we look at now. Can we do that? In thank you. Instead of the one that was actually published, so you all have received it, and um, that's the one we'll look at now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Mabers. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, members of the committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here tonight. This presentation is going to be significantly different than the presentations that you normally get here at the uh, legal committee. We're going to go into the little bit of the background, a little bit of the history, and a little bit of the thought that went into putting together the ordinance as it exists so far, and then what we're going to be looking at into the future. Obviously, at the end of the uh, meeting this evening, we are hoping that you will consider to recommend authorizing to advertise and hold the public hearing to consider adopting proposed ordinance 2109 regulating cannabis, uh, both commercial and the uh, recreational. Just to give you a, a little bit of background, our outline tonight, we're going to talk about the uh, background information and the rationale that we put together. And I do want to once again acknowledge that this was a team effort putting this together. There is absolutely no way one individual could put this together. In fact, I know of a couple of cities here in New Mexico that are hiring outside consultants that are familiar with uh, ordinances in Colorado, California, Oregon, and other places to try to get on board and get out in front of this. Had it not been for the help of, uh, of Spencer and of Parker and Josh and Scott Stark contributed to part of this as well uh, in dealing with some of the other issues. Just about everybody, this ordinance has touched just about every single person's hands at the staff level at one time or another and we've taken input from everyone right up to and including about 10 o'clock this morning. I was still getting input on what you have in front of you tonight. So we want to recognize the effort that went into putting this together. But the outline for tonight's presentations, again, we're going to talk about the background and the information uh, on the state of New Mexico's Cannabis Regulation Act. We'll also discuss the three major issues that are going to be dealt with in this draft of the ordinance with the understanding that we will be revisiting this ordinance month after month after month, most likely for the next two or three years. We're probably going to have in the next 90 days the framework and the basic ordinance put together. But if any of you attended yesterday's uh, NMML meeting where Linda Trujillo, she is the uh, director of the New Mexico CCD, Cannabis, is this Canna, um, yeah. <laughs> Cannabis Department. Anyway, she is the probably 50% or more of the answers to the questions coming from the field yesterday were, I don't know, we're going to try to figure that out, we're working on that. Uh, in other words, the state, even trying to react to what the state is going to be doing, is going to be somewhat of a guessing game going into the future. Okay. Tonight we're going to deal specifically though with personal possession and use, the zoning and development requirements, and non-conforming uses. Okay. Well, as everybody knows, the uh, Ordinance was put together by the New Mexico legislature and they approved it uh, earlier this year. The manu uh, it established a framework for the manufacture, sale, possession, cultivation of all cannabis derived products uh, effective June 29, 2021. Now, it put it in place, but of course the regulations have yet to be developed. The uh, Regulation Act provides that local jurisdictions may adopt, and this is where we're coming from, the regulation, they may adopt time, place, and manner rules that do not conflict with the Cannabis Regulation Act or the Dean Johnson, D. Johnson Clean Air Act. So we're trying to put something together that works within the rules, but also represents the desires of the city of Roswell, and most importantly, to protect our most vulnerable populations in the area, which include children, people with health issues, uh, people that may be going through a recovery or an addiction program, and uh, other things. So, Looking at the timeline, the reason we're having to react so quickly and while we're having to spend so much time and effort bringing this is that no later by s than September 1st, uh, the state is going to create the Cannabis Regulatory Advisory Committee and the CCD is going to begin accepting and processing licenses. As part of that licensing procedure, 
they are, the uh, applicants are going to be asked, okay, where are you putting your facility? What type of facility are you going to have? And do you have permission for this facility from the local jurisdiction? That's us. So we have to get way out in front of this thing because we've already got people knocking on our door, sending us email, calling us on the phone, wanting to know where they can put their cannabis establishment. And not just the dispensaries, we're talking about everything from cultivation facilities, manufacturing, processing, distribution, logistics, the whole nine yards, every aspect of this. So no later than September 21st, uh, September 1, the CCD will begin accepting and processing. No later than January 21, they will begin issuing licenses to begin conducting uh, business activities uh, for people who are lost, uh, licensed in medical cannabis. And then no later than April 1st, retail sales begin of cannabis of all types, both medicinal and, well, medicinal can continue, but recreational will also be in place at that point. So the city of Roswell, we are going to be responsible now for enacting those controls and restrictions related to the possession, uh, use, cultivation, manufacture, sales of cannabis and cannabis derived products. Okay. We are also responsible though to provide proper and adequate protection for the health, safety, and welfare of the residents and visitors to the city. Okay. The intent of our ordinance, of course, is to establish a general framework. What you have in front of you right now is the first 15 pages of what has already been drafted about 60 pages of a complete ordinance. It was just too large, too unwieldy. We could not have put everything together and adequately edit it in time to bring it to you today. So we decided to bring you about 25% of it, the most important, what we feel are the most important sections. You will see another section next month, and then you'll see a section the month after that, and we will continue to amend. This is also why we decided to create a comprehensive ordinance. Okay? Because cannabis regulations cover everything from our business licensing to the zoning to the development code, all the way down to and including taxation, it was going to be far too difficult to go back and try to amend those individual portions of the municipal code over and over and over again. We'd be taking stuff out, putting stuff back. We were guaranteed to miss something. We were guaranteed to make a mistake. So the decision was made uh, by staff as, with the support of the Cannabis Task Force to go ahead and create a brand new chapter in the ordinance. So this is chapter 27. It will stand alone so that when we come forward at a later date with additional information, when we come forward with corrections, when we come forward with amendments, we will only be amending this chapter. We will not have to worry about all the other chapters of the municipal code. So what you have before you is that general framework. We're working currently on guidance and regulatory information uh, from a number of different uh, states. Uh, we're using California and Colorado kind of as guidance. I, uh, as everybody knows, I came here from California. I spent the last, the previous five or six years working on cannabis ordinances and other things. I have a pretty good background understanding and knowing what works well for both the municipalities and what works well for the industry itself. So we're taking all of that information and I'm providing a lot of background and other information as we pull through this and modify it to resolve some of the concerns we have here in the city. Okay. Given our circumstances with the lack of information, again, we are focusing on three areas in particular, the personal possession, the zoning and development requirements, and those non-conforming uses. Okay. Personal possession. This is probably the one that's causing most everyone the most heartache right now in the city, opening up the ability for people to grow their own cannabis at their own home, as well as possess significant amounts of cannabis. Okay. Basically what it comes down to is the city has, or excuse me, the state has legalized the uh, possession and consumption of certain amounts of cannabis for anyone 21 years of age and older. A maximum of two ounces of cannabis and a maximum of 16 grams of concentrated cannabis. Those are all in the ordinance. In addition to basic possession, and this is one that is causing us a concern from a zoning and development perspective, a maximum of 12 cannabis plants per household in the interior of an enclosed structure. 
And we want to make that very clear that you will not see people growing cannabis in their yards. They must do it inside an enclosed structure. We must make sure that it is secured, it is lockable. So they will be able to pull permits and put erect greenhouses according to the current uh, development code. But any activity must take place either inside the home itself or inside a greenhouse or other structure on their property. We will continue to need to develop framework regarding the controls and restrictions develop, uh, related to public possession of cannabis and cannabis derived products as well as continue to work on home cultivation. Okay. Okay. Zoning and development. This is a big section in our ordinance. Uh, we do have the goal of protecting health, safety and welfare of Roswell citizens and visitors. Uh, so therefore all cannabis cultivation processing, manufacturing, retail sales, on-site consumption, and cannabis-related special events. I think that covers just about every aspect of, of the cannabis industry right there, okay, will be prohibited in certain areas of the city. Okay. We are looking at other ordinances and other cities that uh, provide us with the justification for this. We're also looking at areas where uh, children gather, uh, places where people may be in rehabilitation or other things for other drug-related issues, or in areas where there is an expectation that there will be a, there's an expectation that a certain type of industry or lifestyle will be promoted. Okay. Uh, the top three areas right off the top, the downtown historic district. Okay? There's also, there's a number of uh, cases out there in a number of cities that have determined that cannabis sales and recreation do not promote the culture or history or the uh, uh, opportunities available within a historic district. We, feed, we happen to agree. So the, off the top, our downtown historic district. Our downtown business district, C3, again, the uh, cannabis in our C3 downtown district where we're trying to revitalize it based upon tourism and other things, we do not believe that necessarily cannabis is inappropriate uh, there. And then our railroad district or our metropolitan redevelopment area, which also includes a number of historic structures if you've been down there. Again, the idea being that we are going to revitalize that area as a combination of tourist and entertainment and other things, and it may be inappropriate for cannabis-related uh, or uh, industry or business in that area. Okay. Additionally, we're looking at uh, some uh, restrictions. These are allowed within the state uh, law that no cannabis uh, establishments can be located within 300 feet of any residential district. We've also added in there because of the concerns over our children and uh, potential uh, cross-contamination, pollination, health issues and everything else. No cannabis uh, industry uh, businesses within 300 feet of all schools, parks, churches, recreational facilities, childcare, military facilities. Again, military facilities still fall under the jurisdiction of the federal government and the federal government has yet to approve cannabis. Okay. Retirement facilities, medical health facilities, mental health facilities, addiction centers, rehabilitation centers. Okay. Continuing with the zoning that uh, it, what we're trying to do here though, we do have to provide a pathway for development. That is very clear in the state legislation. But we feel that the most appropriate districts for uh, utilization of cannabis would fall within the current C2 and I2 zones with additional restrictions because of the concerns over health, safety, and welfare of the community. Okay. Sales and consumption, uh, cannabis sales and establishments, that's recreational and medicinal, will be located in the commercial cannabis zone. This is what we're calling our C-CAN zone. This will be a floating zone that will be allowed to be placed over the C2 district in certain areas where cannabis uh, facilities can be located. Cannabis uh, cultivation, manufacturing, processing, distribution, and special events must be held in the industrial cannabis or the ICANN zone. That will be a floating zone that will be available for use by builders and de by developers and business operators within our current I2 zone. Okay. Finally, we have to get to non-conforming uses. We have a number of existing medical cannabis facilities, both that are operational and then some are on the way to being operational uh, as well. 
These are, we are required to protect, uh, provide certain protections that will allow them to continue as they have done before. So there is a section in our ordinance that uh, the previously permitted cannabis establishments or cannabis related uses, including those medical dispensaries, may continue to operate as in the same manner that they have previously. However, if they decide they want to expand, if they decide they want to upgrade, if they want to rebuild, or if they want to change their licensing, in other words, if they want to go from medical to recreational, they will no longer be a non-conforming use and they will be subject to all the new regulations, which may include ha them having to relocate from their current facility, depending on where they're located in the city. Just to give you an idea of what can be done as a non-conforming use, and this is all spelled out in our current zoning code. We've taken that almost verbatim from our existing zoning code and dropped it into the new cannabis ordinance. They are allowed to do repairs and alterations. In other words, if they decide they, uh, they want to upgrade the look of their interior and exterior of their facility, they absolutely can. Additions and enlargements to a certain extent are allowed. Restoration as a result of damages, but only up to a certain point. If there's more than 50% damage caused by a fire or other event, they will not allow, be allowed to be rebuilt. They must go ahead and take their losses and move forward. Okay? Biggest thing here is discontinuance of a non-conforming use. If they discontinue for a period of six months or more, they are no longer considered to be an active use and they must reapply for permits under the current zoning designation. And then last but not least, a vacant non-conforming use. If they vacate the premises, it's considered to be non-operational and they lose their op ability to operate at that location. Okay. So to tie everything up, again, the New Mexico legislature, they gave us a set of rules. We're doing the best we can to operate within those rules and to develop a framework for this reg these regulations that will allow the city of Roswell not only to uh, stay within state laws and operate within state laws, but will also provide enough safety to the public as well as the, sa uh, the welfare of our children and our most vulnerable uh, communities. The other thing to remember, though, is many of these rules here are also designed to protect the cannabis grower. Okay? Cannabis is, uh, as the industry matures, what we're finding that more and more, the legitimate growers and out there are very protective of their brand. They're very protective of their strain. Okay? One of the reasons for not allowing outdoor grows is because of cross-pollination. If a, one strain of cannabis cross-pollinates with another strain of cannabis, you lose the entire crop and the many, many thousands of dollars that have gone in uh, into putting that crop together. So the requirement for indoor grow not only protects the health, safety, and welfare of our population here, but also protects the investment of the cannabis growers themselves. Okay. We do have the ability, as we said, to uh, adopt time, place, and manner rules that do not conflict with the Cannabis Regulation Act or the D. Johnson Clean Indoor Air Act. Committee members, that does, uh, Madam Chair, that ends my presentation. We are here to answer any questions or deal with any concerns or issues. Uh, obviously, we do need to move the, because of the time frame allowed. We are looking forward to receiving a, a approval to move this forward to the city council so that we can set it for an agenda so that we can begin letting the uh, people of the city of Roswell and the potential cannabis developers and business establishments know exactly where they sit within the upcoming state framework. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody realize how much time and energy and effort and brainstorming and hair pulling and all of that that's gone into this so thank you all very much um, let me see first of all just a court of generalities if there are any questions or comments from committee members and then we'll we'll go from there Councillor Perry go ahead thank you madam uh, chair uh, just a few observations, if I may. I don't know that anybody's watching this right now <laughs> uh, uh, live. We've just got a few folks out here, uh, mainly staff that are uh, here at the meeting today. But I just want to uh, make it clear, I, I, uh, I was out of town. I actually drove back five and a half hours today just for this meeting. After this meeting's over, I drive five and a half hours to be back with my family. Um, I was on the call yesterday with the Municipal League and with the uh, Superintendent. Is it Trujillo? Is that correct? 
am I correct, Kevin? Is it Trujillo? It is. Okay. And it, um, it's superintendent. Superintendent. Title. Yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, Superintendent Trujillo. And um, one thing that I I gathered from it that was just sort of alarming and concerning to me is I almost felt like there's not a whole lot of answers from the state at this point. Uh, we had a two-hour meeting, and I appreciate the superintendent's time and, and, and that she didn't have to give that time to the Municipal League, but she did do that for us. But I can say that I, I, I left there with more questions, I think, than answers. And I almost feel as if the state is sh saying, you know, let, tell us what you're going to do, and then we'll let you know if you can do it or not, and, uh, which is just sort of alarming and concerning to me. Uh, but, however, I heard over and over in that phone call um, on the Zoom meeting, uh, you know, you have to use your current uh, zoning. You've got to use your current zoning. You can't change your zoning. You don't have time to change your zoning because the 1st of September, um, I, I think we've got time and that we'll be able to stand. We've got to, we've got to um, if no one else, I don't know what other communities are moving forward quickly. Uh, I do feel like a lot of this we're going to end up having to massage and work as we go through. But I almost feel like this uh, particular legislation uh, specifically, and I don't mean any offense to any of our legislators across the state, but I don't feel like this was a, le le uh, a legislative driven uh, statute that now we have, law that we have. I think this is more industry driven than anything that I've seen come from. Uh, the state legislature so far. We've got 18 states so far, Colorado, Washington, Alaska, Oregon, uh, California, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Michigan, Vermont, Illinois, Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, South Dakota, Virginia, New Mexico now, and Connecticut. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, the District of um, uh, Washington, D.C., and then one territory, Tory Guam. Um, and I feel like um, the further down on the list we become, uh, the industry is learning the mistakes they made in California, the mistakes they goofed up in, in Colorado, the mistakes that they went through uh, in Oregon, Cal uh, Maine, Massachusetts, any of these. And uh, the further down the list we go, the more uh, fine-tuned they're going to be in trying to keep local option from regulating anything. So. Uh, but I don't think that that should stop us from moving forward. I think that I, I did want to say also publicly, and I'll say again in the main meeting, I appreciate your your efforts as the chair of this committee in ensuring that uh, Rawls was not just going to sit still and just wait. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Corn uh, Best's um, uh, uh, steadfastness in this that we move forward, and staff has just really got out here. And I believe what we have, though it's not a complete document yet by any uh, means, I think we're, we're ahead of the ball game in this thing. And I think there, there may indeed be challenges ahead of us, but I think that we've got to step out and, on the ball field and start playing and not wait for someone to tell us how we're going to play. Um, so that's my statement, I guess I could say. My question is, I know the answer, but I think that it's worth stating uh, why, uh, you mentioned a little bit at the end, but why are we requiring structures at, at homes? Why, why are we not allowing just, uh, you know, it being grown in the front yard? Why are we trying to do that? You, you talked about the health and the well, welfare of the, of, the, of the citizens, but if you could just share just a little bit more uh, on that portion, if you could. Commissioner Perry, thank you so much for, or Councilor Perry, thank you so much for that uh, question. It really comes down to uh, two or three different issues. Number one, let's keep in mind that cannabis consumption, use, possession, and everything else for anyone under 21 years of age is illegal. We must treat it very similar to the way we treat alcohol and other things. It should not be uh, accessible by children, even on private property. Okay? We don't want people coming back and forth, getting into, uh, into people's yards, stealing it, smoking it, and, and causing a problem. So the second thing, though, is if you've ever been around cannabis, especially when it's in the flowering stage, you will notice a very unique odor that comes along with it. Some people find this odor offensive. Our current nuisance ordinance, of course, describes that we are allowed to take certain steps to deal with 
odors that are offensive to the average person in, uh, in the city. Uh, by requiring that all grow, even home grows, take place indoors or inside a, a, uh, a structure, we will eliminate that. The last thing, though, and this is something that I found out on a very personal level, the cannabis flower and the pollen from the flower it causes a highly allergic reaction in some people, anaphylactic type reactions in certain people. I found this out uh, firsthand when I was touring a flowering room in, in uh, Arizona while I was working on a project in California. They wanted me to tour this uh, flowering room. You go into a flowering room and what you find out is because of the design of the pollen, the way it, the nature has designed it, it looks like a, uh, a barb and it sticks everywhere to you. You can't get it off readily. So once you are exposed to the pollen, it sticks to your clothes, it sticks to your hair, it sticks to your skin. And for anybody who is even remotely allergic to it, you begin to have a reaction almost immediately. I was fortunate, I got over to a CVS drugstore, I managed to uh, take some uh, antihistamine and then I got back to my hotel room and was able to shower and I recovered. But there was probably an hour or two of my life where I was thinking, this is not going to be fun. Okay. We do have, again, this falls under the issues of health, public health, public safety, public welfare. Absolutely. And so that is where we feel it is totally and completely appropriate. We actually have, I believe in the audience this evening, Kimberly Rutledge okay, from the La Casa Behavioral Health. She has done a tremendous amount of background. She's been a tremendous source of information for us on public health issues surrounding the use of cannabis and especially those health issues related to children and other things. And I believe we are well within our right to regulate the time, place, and manner even of the home grow situations. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, Councilor, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and then I think I'll, I'll reserve. I don't know if this is for you, Mr. Mavers, or for Mr. Patterson. Um, the something else from the conversation that was rather confusing with uh, Superintendent Trujillo yesterday. I see a clear difference between medical and recreational. Um, I, I, I do recognize medicinal uh, uh, benefits. Uh, I've known people who they, they ha it has helped. I, I recognize it. I, I am quite concerned that we have not been able, as uh, science has not been able to safely regulate it yet, uh, so that's a concern, but I do recognize that there is. But it seemed to me on the phone call as if um, there, there's not really being put, in, and uh, Councillor Foster and I were talking about this just earlier, it doesn't seem like they're seeing any difference between the medical and the recreational, that, that if you've got medical, recreational just comes in, it's just all parts, just one thing, and I think Councillor Foster, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he used the example of, is an aspirin and an, uh, aspirin and an opioid the same thing? Uh, you know, they're, they're dealt with differently. Ha, from the, from the conversation that you heard as well on the phone, or maybe uh, uh, our attorney maybe gives some information there, is the state really looking at this as a conjoined issue, or, or, or are we going to see a clear separation with these two? Well, I can't, I did not, I was not able to attend the meeting yesterday because I was in uh, negotiations, but I will say um, that as, although the Cannabis Regulation Act does basically bring all types of cannabis activities under one set of rules, uh, and the way that the Regulation Act is written, they're treated separately for a lot of different purposes, including, you know, taxation and things like that, so it's not really it doesn't really make a lot of sense that you could just have them all, have it all lumped in together because there are different aspects of them. An important one being, uh, you know, for example, if you have a medical marijuana card, you can purchase, and you're over 18 or even under 18 potentially, you can purchase marijuana, but recreationally, if you're under 21, you just can't do it. So there's all kinds of reasons why they're different from each other. Uh, and, and the way that the Regulation Act is written, it does contemplate that there's going to be Re you know, recreational establishments, retail establishments, medical retail establishments, and ones that can do both. However, at least as I read the, the, the statutes, those are three separate categories, and you're going to get one of those depending on what type of uh, application you make to the state. Whether the state is, you know, what the regulation uh, 
agency that's been set up is doing right now with their regulations, it's a black box to us. But at least as I read the statutes, that should continue to be a distinction that matters. Okay. I'm sure hoping that, that, that we're going to see that clarification uh, further down the road, but uh, anyway. And, and if I may, just to make it, to simplify it, my notes from yesterday and what I interpreted is certainly you can sell both and that I, there was a limit. I didn't get the percentage of, of how, if you're going to combine medical with uh, recreational, there has to be a certain percentage that's medical. The question I have about the medical is that, um, or no, let's, let's, let's say the recreational, you have to be 21 in order to purchase it, but there are those under 21 who have medical marijuana carts. So who, I mean, who's, somebody other than the person under 21 who has a medical card is going to have to come in to purchase it. That doesn't make sense to me that they're not selling to the person who has the license or the uh, mm -hmm. perm whatever permit to say they can purchase or use it. So I think that I'm, I'm going to say more than anything as the state goes through figuring this out, they're going to have a little more trouble than we are because we're going to have to follow what they have. But I think my point more than anything is that as you really research all of this and look at the state statute and try to pull from it what we uh, need to be doing here, it's very complicated and there are no easy answers to a lot of those questions yet. So again, I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's part of the reason our little steering committee are, is limiting what we're putting out right now. Um, to the thing, to the things that we that we discuss, the time, manner, and place, is what we really are focusing on at this point in time. The other thing I learned, just just for information, um, is that although the state will be uh, accepting requests for permits or license or whatever, they have 90 days to answer to that. So hence the. Uh, January 1st, I guess it is, uh, date. But um, although they have their time to uh, issue a license or to at least uh, 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 say, you know, go through it and, and question and whatever, um, we have to have something in place by September 1st when those are issued because they have to have something from the city um, when they take their, their request to the state and We've got to get some things in place now so they have that to take instead of a total uh, ignoring, I guess, of cannabis at this point. I don't know what I said. I'm <laughs> no, I, I, I got it. Did you get it? <laughs> if, if I could uh, help Councilor Perrier just real quick uh, with his, his concerns. From the state's perspective, from an industry perspective as well, everything is lumped into a category of commercial cannabis. If it's not personal possession and personal use, it's commercial cannabis. And commercial cannabis covers the areas of cultivation, processing, manufacturing, distribution, everything up to the point of the actual sale. Only when we get to the sale do you find that division between the medicinal, the recreational, and whatever else. The cultivator uh, can grow any type of cannabis they choose. They can utilize whatever methods they choose to grow it. They can create whatever kind of product they want. And there is a significant difference at the grow level, at the cultivation level, between recreational, medicinal, and pharmaceutical grade cannabis. That's the other thing that's coming as well as a pharmaceutical grade plant that it uh, contains very strict quantities of the active ingredients, the THC and the CBDs and, and other things. So the industry is still shaking out, but for the purposes of the state legislation, anything that is regulated by the state, whether it's medicinal or recreational, is considered commercial cannabis. Uh, Councilor, this is the exact language from the statute. The division shall include a clear designation on all licenses and permits that indicates whether the license or permit is for medical cannabis activity, commercial cannabis activity, or both, 
or for cannabis training and education programs. Go. Yeah. And Madam Chair, just a few other things. I just want to say as far as the specifics of this ordinance, I did request and I appreciate uh, staff doing this on Article 5, which is page 2, uh, line number 35, which is Article 5, personal possession and use, section 27-41, personal possession on A. It did say adults 21 years of older may possess a maximum of two ounces, yada, yada, tell us all about it. I, I just did not want it to look as if, yeah, we're going to allow this. Yeah, this is great. This is wonderful. Uh, I'm certainly not in, in, in favor of what's happening the way it is, so I thought it was very important, and I appreciate staff in the way that they wrote it. They've added in there pursuant to the requirements of the Cannabis Regulation Act, um, of nine, and then it goes through everything there. Then it goes on to explain. So I just thought that was important at least for me to identify why we're having Good. to do what we're doing. Uh, I do have another question, and, and this is just questions I don't know the answer to, and I'm sorry for being ignorant to this. And my understanding as well that uh, the only thing that they're not allowed to sell is liquor, that they can sell, according to the meeting yesterday, that they could sell uh, Cheetos and, and Dr. Pepper and Coke and dog food and anything else that the only thing at these that these establishments that they cannot sell is liquor or am I misunderstanding that? I just want some clarification. That's my understanding as well. Reading the legislation is the only prohibition there is that you can't have a liquor license and a cannabis license in the same establishment. So the only prohibition there. And that, that's a little fearful the for me. The only prohibition is alcohol. I'm sorry, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, for selling different products in the same location. There's a specific prohibition that says you cannot put, you can't take something from the Alcohol Control Act, one of those licenses, and cite it in the same place as something that's coming out of the cannabis regulation. They can't okay. be in the same place. But other than that, there's no other prohibitions that I can think of. Just trouble for me. I, I wonder if you're, if you're not referring to the fact that it's not only smokable cannabis, it's edible and other, that you I, can sell. I, I, I'm just looking at, unless legislators see this flaw as I see it, in the future, people can open up a convenience store uh, that uh, now they're going to have to be underneath the guidelines of all the marijuana, but they're going to be able to sell a bulk of everything which then encourages more people to come in to get that bag of chips. But then, you know, you know how it is with everything else. Uh, you know, you've got your little uh, end caps of things to encourage you. And um, uh, I mean, I'm just going to be transparent with everyone here, uh, as I think everyone knows my feelings, but I'm just really discouraged. Um, this is not going to be beneficial to the people of the city of Roswell, New Mexico. This is not going to be beneficial to the citizens of the people of the New Mexico, this is going to be beneficial to the industry, period. It's going to be beneficial to attorneys. It's going to be beneficial to real estate agents, uh, you know, who are going to be selling these properties, and it's going to be beneficial to the industry, uh, period. We've seen what has happened with the Rocky Mountain study from Colorado. We've seen how this has ha affected. We've got uh, uh, Ms. Rutley here with uh, uh, behavioral health. We know this is, we see this, that we've seen what's happened. I'm just very discouraged to see that we have an industry-driven um, law now uh, that is very alarming to me. I'm not here to, to, to argue the medical uh, point at all. I'm here to talk about the recreational end of it. And I just think that we've got to stand there again, uh, just try to do what we can to try to be uh, protective of our people, the children, and those that are most vulnerable uh, in our community. With that being said, uh, Madam Chair, I think that what uh, has been put forth um, is very interesting. I, I really <laughs> appreciate Well, that's to say the Can't least. Can't you say something? <laughs> I, 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 I'm trying to say it a little bit better. It's very. Um, uh, logically put together. Uh, this is not something that's just been thrown together and just pasted from other places to try to hurry and get something together. Staff has done a phenomenal job uh, with the uh, floating zone. Never, never even thought, of, you know, I had to go. I want to talk study. about that, but go ahead, um, yes. But I think those are things that we are identifying 
that are, are going to be able to be beneficial to, to at least do our best to protect uh, those that are most vulnerable. So, thank, thank you. you. Councilor Best, do you have comments at this time? No, ma'am. Oh. I'm, I'm just sitting back and listening. I can, and, I can tell. And my brain is just working. Yeah. So we're good. Okay. Now. Thank you. Councilor Foster. Uh, I, I do have several things marked, uh, but one of the things that was brought up currently, if you're 18 years old and you have a medical marijuana card, can you go in and buy? Okay. So when uh, I'm looking at section 2741, for any person under 21 years of age to, to possess, consume, or obtain cannabis, that doesn't apply if you're, you have a minus uh, medical card. Which uh, subsection for any person? On, okay. Are you talking about C2? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Line 8. So if you go up to the top of C, unless otherwise allowed in the Cannabis Regulation Act or the Lynn and Aaron Compassionate Use Act, it shall be unlawful, then subsection 2, for any person under 21 years of age. Yep. So if it's lawful under the Compassionate Use Act, in other words, it's medical marijuana, then okay. a person under 21 could do it. It would not violate this subsection. Cool. All right. And then going down to 2742, um, on line 28, all cultivation operations must take place indoors within a permanent structure that is enclosed on all sides. So no garages, correct? I'm sorry, Councilor Foster. I was trying to uh, catch up to where you were at. What uh, section are we looking at? Uh, 2742, line 28. Yeah, page three. All cultivation operations must take place indoors with an impermanent structure that is enclosed on all sides. So that would exclude garages, correct? That would include garages, yes. Include or exclude? Include. They have to be enclosed on all sides. Okay, but okay, that garage door goes up and suddenly it's not enclosed on all four sides. Well, I believe even a greenhouse is going to have a door of some type for you to enter and exit. Okay, well. So does the house. So does the house. Yeah. And so, um, all right. The, the next question I have, construction or, or is line 32 of the same, same section, construction or installation of an at-home greenhouse for cannabis cultivation requires a permit from the City of Roswell Planning and Zoning Office. If I was going to build a greenhouse for tomatoes, I don't need a permit? Actually, for any permanent structure, you're going to need to come by our office and at least get a placement permit. So we otherwise, you don't need to have for the can cannabis, con I mean, if you're going, that's what I'm saying. It, 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 we're, we're writing this, making it look like it's exclusive because to of the, cannabis. Because of the, uh, the concerns over security, concerns over access to children and everything else, we will be reviewing a, uh, a greenhouse for cannabis cultivation differently than we would one for tomatoes, yes. Right, but, if I, but what I'm saying though is, the fact is if I'm building a greenhouse in my backyard, I need, a, I need it whether it's for cannabis or whether it's for, for tomatoes. I think the idea is that there would be more stringent requirements on a greenhouse for cannabis because nobody's trying to break in and steal tomatoes to get high. Well, I understand that, but what I'm just still saying is on here, it's, it's saying it's specific too. And, um, but that also draws me to the point where if they're doing, it, they're doing a, a aquaculture grow in their basement, now are we licensing that? Are we? Again, no, we, we cannot license it to, we're not licensing the actual grow. But a permit. Okay, we're permitting the facilities that the grow is taking place in. Now, but if they decide to grow on the interior of their home, there's not a, a whole lot we can do about that. But if they're going to grow outside the house or outside of the garage or in the yard, then yes, we want to make sure that wherever they're growing it is secure. And presumably there would not be the same security concerns in a basement as in an outdoor greenhouse. Well, we come back down to the point of uh, draining their, the nitrogen fertilizer water um, into our sewer system is, is a problem. Um, so, um, so that's, it gets back to that point where, but this doesn't say a separate building. It's saying if you're going to have a, a, a grow in, it, at, your, at your house, 
that you need a permit. So that's what I'm trying, I'm, right? Because it says construction or installation of an, app. well, if you're in, installing it in your basement, this is saying we need a permit. I think a greenhouse requires windows. Like it's got, like that's the concept of a greenhouse, right? But that's not, this doesn't say, green, it says installation of an at home, well, it does say at home greenhouse. But there again, an at home installation of a grow, you can have grow lights and not have, um, so, so we're, this is specific to greenhouse. Okay. Let me, I, I don't know if this is a good suggestion or not, but at some point we've, we're, de, we're at the, pro, in the process of developing um, definitions and that may be answered, Councillor Foster, if we had a definition of a greenhouse so that we know more specifically what we're talking about and the fact that a cannabis greenhouse, I believe, requires security and, and some of those things that a, so to me it would merit a definition. I'll, I'll go what, to staff and see. What you do not have in front of you this evening is the entire section on development requirements and the regulatory requirements. Okay? That is, we've got that drafted at this point. We will probably be bringing that forward to you next month. Uh, at this point as an addition to this, but all the details, re uh, re we needed to get the zoning districts and the basic uh, framework set up. Again, this is a work in progress and all of the issues you're bringing up right now, Councilor, will be addressed in, in future revisions. Uh, but, right. and well, and those are just I'm things sure that- I'm sure Spencer is taking notes madly right now to make sure that we address these issues. Uh, as far as the the, industrial waste coming from some of these uh, and including coming from the home grows uh, we are we do have concerns about the the wastewater in particular because it will be uh, if there if you have a, a grower who is talented and capable they know that uh, they need to provide a significant number of, of uh, different type of uh, nitrates and other uh, types of fertilizers and things the water that comes off of this contains all of those that Typically what happens in an industrial facility is that water is routed to a clarifier and a dryer, it's dried out, and then the solids, any remaining nitrates and everything else, are sent off to be uh, disposed of uh, at a uh, waste reclamation site of one type or another. How we're gonna deal with that with the, some of these home grows is a little more problematic. Correct, because nitrates hitting our uh, wastewater can kill a bed pretty quick. Let me just say too, if, if you look at the, the um, rendition, what do I want to say? The, the, uh, the ordinance that we're proposing today is the one that um, Mr. Maver spoke of, still, still looking at at 10 o'clock this morning, it does have a list of, uh, of information that we want as development standards, which includes uh, water availability and effluence uh, uh, disposal of of water of uh, you know waste as well as solid waste so as as we're saying that that will come um, as we continue to enhance the the ordinance I, I agree I know it's a living document but <laughs> I was just some Forever. of those things I wanted to be specific on um, and and make and sure we that we, we we will um, the, the next questions I have on um, page five, it's 2762, line 42 and on. Um, lot or parcel size requirements reserved. Are we gonna be adding a different, something reserved for, I mean, right now it's, we're just. Right okay. now it's in, it's in the uh, outline, I guess, <laughs> and, and it's reserved right now. We will be adding later. That, okay. yeah, that was a, uh, a recommendation we took to heart from the city attorney, knowing that we were going to be making a number of uh, revisions to this. The last thing we wanted to do was have to go through the entire ordinance and renumber everything every time we made a revision. So we left room for uh, additions and growth. I appreciate that, and I, and I notice on line one on page six, we also talk about affluent disposal. So, I mean, we're gonna, we are gonna be dealing with it. So, so I recognize that, but I just wanted to touch on those. Um, sure. 
I, I do appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I do um, really like the, I think it's creativity with the floating zone, and and um, and I appreciate all the work. And with that, I'll I'll yield. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Best has some questions. Let's let's get to the floating do zone. We will because I think it's really critical that we have an understanding of that and and that we talk about what it is. So if we can okay. answer my, your questions and we'll get well, back. Well, my quick question was the water. I heard somewhere up here, not when I was sleeping, but somewhere up here that, that it's going to be against the state rules to use municipality waters in private wells. You can't hear me? Is that better? Thank you. That, that they are not allowed to use municipality water and private wells. Am, am I incorrect on that? Probably, because you gotta water it with something. I have not seen a restriction of that nature. I'm not aware of that. Okay, thank you. The only restriction that we're aware of right now that uh, we heard yesterday and we've actually written it into the framework is that the any uh, cannabis establishment will have to provide evidence that they have adequate water, power, utilities, and other things as well, uh, which normally will require a will serve letter from the local municipality or their local jurisdiction, wherever they're getting their water from. Uh, I do know that there have been and continue to be some restrictions on the use of water on uh, Native American lands, because that's federal, that I know certain waters of the United States, uh, while I was doing work in Arizona and eastern the eastern portions of California anything that came from the uh, Colorado River uh, Aquifer was not allowed to be used. They had to drill other wells and other locations. So yeah, water is a big deal um, So if we get in a drought and we know they're growing cannabis We can go to them and say our people need water above you it is, is I believe that there would be the opportunity for a for the city to put together a ordinance or regulations that would define what constitutes a drought and what would define the um, end users. Because that I can eat be, grass, but I can't eat weed. That would be prioritized in the event of a drought. I can eat grass, but I can't eat weed. Sorry. <laughs> but there to are, me there that, are those who do, though. <laughs> well, to me, that's more important that I have water to drink than it is to go down to local pot shop and smoke. I mean, I need to rather, rather even have water to flush with, and, that, and we can use gray water for that. So anyway, just things no, to I, think about. I think that as we continue to work with this, and, and I would hope the state would do the same thing, is recognize how critical water is to other issues pr before it gets to watering Water's more cannabis. important than oil at this point. Sure it is. So just my personal. No, well noted. Thank you. you okay. Um, let me make a, a few comments. Um, first of all, like I say, we're, wor we're working off of a draft that uh, just came out early or last night or whenever. So uh, do we have co copies of that or will we have copies for the full council? We'll have, oh, okay, getting several. Okay, nod. So I'm sorry that we all don't have it in front of us. I did email it to, to, uh, you know. Yeah, if you don't have a copy, we can provide you one. Okay. okay. And maybe I should have one of the later ones because I'm going off of last night. So Thank is this B, V5.2? Is that what we're on? B5? Yes, the latest version is version 5.2, dated July 22nd. So if you've got that in front of you, you're looking at the latest July one. July 22nd. Okay, I've got 07. Oh, then I've got it. No, you've got, yeah. Yeah, mine is 07. It's, it's 21, oh, or no, 2021-07-22. Yeah. Okay, mine's right. Thank you. Seven is the month. Um, let me just make a few really kind of quick comments, if I could, could again, from the presentation that we heard yesterday. Um, and, and then if those who, who are also on it want to correct me or add to it, let's, let's do that. Um, I think one of the things we really need to note as a council, and 
uh, be cognizant of and maybe have discussion on is the fact that um, a distance from churches and, are, and is it churches and something or just churches are not listed in the act? That that's something we're putting in on our own? Yeah, the Cannabis Regulation Act talks about schools, but it does not address churches. Okay. So, currently, we're suggesting that 300 feet from churches be in our ordinance. So we need to look at the fact that that's not required. The question for purposes of the act is whether or not any restriction that we might put is consistent or inconsistent with the provisions of the existing legislation. Uh, I, well, that is a very vague mandate and so we are feeling our way forward. I have, I have some confidence that that concept is not inconsistent because we are allowed to do time, place, and manner, including restrictions on density and uh, uses of the area that are already there. Right. Okay. But I just wanted to call that to, to everyone's attention as it's not part of the, of the state statute at this point. Councilor Perry? It also, you may remember in that conversation yesterday, I can't remember what city it was, but the question did come up that uh, some of the cities were questioning, uh, like a Catholic church. I don't know if that, that's exactly what was mentioned, but they have catechism. Lutheran churches will have that. Oh. A lot of uh, Protestant and Christian churches will have Sunday schools, and that uh, there was school was not defined, and neither was uh, day, child day care. school, child yeah. care, and a lot of churches provide child care, so they were hoping that that was going to be a, an ability, so we'll have to wait and see how that goes. So my well. point is really just to bring it to everyone's attention that it's not in the statute, that we're going kind of above and above what the statute says there. there we also have, a, sorry, I can't thumb through these pages fast enough, but we also have a distance of a quarter of a mile uh, from cannabis facility, for lack of a better word, to another one. That again it is not in statute and probably could be questioned a little bit, but we're, we're trying to, to keep... Go ahead. It does, uh, what the Regulation Act does specifically permit us as the local jurisdiction to regulate the density of these establishments. Density. Okay. So, you so know... So we're being specific in the quarter mile from what we're we're presenting today okay that just wanted to make sure everyone um, had that information um, I, I noted this because obviously it's near and dear to my heart and that is that we have to treat signage just like we would any other business am I correct in that gentlemen mm -hmm. signage needs to be treated as as any other business there's two distinctions. Uh, one, this, the Regulation Act specifically addresses signage on the uh, actual establishment itself, and we're, our hands are pretty tied there. It basically says we cannot restrict or limit their signage on their facility. Um, and with regard to signage in general, I think we had a discussion last year about signage. We had a whole discussion about signage and what we could and couldn't do, and I'll remind you that the issue is uh, about you can again you can regulate the time place and manner of signs like how big they are and where you can put them but you can't regulate the content, content right so if we went and said you can advertise on this but you can't advertise on that or you can advertise and say good things about this but you, or you but you cannot advertise and say bad things about it in other words regulating the speech as opposed to the manner then you would have a problem potentially although it's a very interesting question because all of this arises under federal constitutional law, but cannabis is illegal under, so I don't know how that plays out. It's interesting. <laughs> Madam Chair. Go ahead, Councilor And Perry. also, we discussed this in our meeting as well. You know, you know, we can't regulate that saying bad things are good things, yet somehow the federal government has found out a way to where on massive billboards, but you don't see them anymore because of this. Uh, they were requiring the Surgeon General warnings, you know, for cigarettes, you know, up on the signs on the pack of cigarettes, got that big so I don't understand. I was sort of shocked that we have the ability to regulate uh, a lot of things within signage with everything except for cannabis, you know, for, you know to, to a degree. Um, 
time, place, and manner restrictions are across the board. So we couldn't go in and say, you can advertise for Fritos, but you can't advertise for Doritos, like that kind of stuff. That's what I'm talking about. So. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but no. can, the, can the city insist, if they're gonna put that sign up, they have to put a warning on there saying, I mean, if, we, if that's out of our hands with signs, can we still have them? You can't put that sign up unless you have I, that warning on there. I could look at that. I'm, I, I, need to, I would need to research exactly what the case law is on those Surgeon General warnings and whether we would have a similar authority. That's a, I'd have to look at that. No, no. Councilor, the, with respect to signage and advertising both, those will be sections that will be in the ordinance. They're coming. We're taking all this information in. The one thing I, I would like to verify, as long as we are, we're all here, I do believe we have significant authority to regulate the type of the content of much of this. Specifically, and, and you reminded me of the uh, what they called the Joe Camel Law uh, a number of years ago relative to tobacco industry, that nothing can be perceived or uh, otherwise intended that may entice the use of the product by children. And the Regulation Act itself actually says something similar. You can't market your cannabis products towards children okay. in any way. That's, that's already in state statute as well. Okay. And Good. since we already have a sign ordinance in place, this is where we cannot regulate anything any differently. It's just a matter of importing and adjusting our current sign ordinance. It's, we regulate signage around town. Right. That's, that's in the books. How we regulate the signage for, for this particular industry is going to be only a minor modification to what we already do, taking into account many of the concerns you all have expressed. The, the other or another in interesting thing, if I understood it correctly, which it does not affect what we're doing here now, it's just in the, my notes in this order, and that is that medical cannabis uh, will not be taxed uh, as we go through this according to other state statutes um, and that's and, and of course medical cannabis is determined by the Department of Health so again another kind of um, addition into how they're how this is all gonna fit together so that's uh, that I thought was kind of interesting um, nothing says you have to allow cannabis where you don't allow cigarettes and um, where cannabis can be sold I think we've had a discussion at least we did in our steering committee about whether or not cannabis could be sold from a, a, say a food truck or something like that I think the superintendent was was pretty clear in that um, security restrictions pretty well prohibit that from happening um, also I think a farmers market right. was was that mentioned was as well so I think state statute is taking care of those those prohibitions if I'm not mistaken yeah and the, the legislation is a little ambiguous on this but I assume that it's going to be somewhat like alcohol in the sense that there's going to be a both a license you're licensed as a seller but you also have a licensed premises so I don't know how you'd have a licensed premises if you're in a truck and you know maybe they could invent some kind of like picnic license for cannabis for the uh, for the farmers market. I don't know, but as far as I can think of, I think you'd have a problem right off the bat with having a licensed premises if you're going to drive around in a car or a truck. And then another interesting thing I thought again, just for information, as we continue to go through this, is there can't be any con cannot be consumption where the product is sold. Those are two separate licenses. So. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting thing that we'll need to pay a little closer attention to as we get through this. Um, okay, the security issue. Um, we've talked about the wastewater. It's going to have to be purified and all of that. We'll get into what we need there uh, later. Um, And the fact that the state has 90 days to approve a person's license. That's what my notes show. So go ahead, Councilor Perry. Floating zone, if we could. Yes, make sure. I, yeah, I want to, I'm going to get, I want to go through this, but that's kind of what my, my notes show if, if, um, just for information. As we go through what, um, has currently been put out, or put out, 
put forth, I guess is what I should say. Um, I'm on page four, and um, this is from what, this is not from what was published, this is from what was, what is being presented, is under Article 7, Zoning and Development Requirement, Requirement Section 27-61, Introduction Purpose and Intent. You will notice we've added a paragraph A, which is an introduction of a floating zone district. And I think rather than read this, I'm going to turn to our staff to sort of define this for us, primarily because this is something new, uh, at least to me, I know to those of us that were learning about it. Uh, as far as Roswell's concerned, I, I think we're looking at it as an answer um, as to how to sort of handle those, these. And Parker, I'm going to turn to you again. If you could explain to us what a floating zone district is, please. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure that Kevin may have some comments as well. Good. I'll just introduce it as, you know, it's kind of the reverse of a typical zoning type of scenario where you have a zoning map and you delineate certain districts ahead of time. This is C1, this is C2, whatever, and it's there ahead of time. The floating zone, as the name implies, floats out there in theory until, an a until someone comes forth with an application, I want to put this, and they give you a site, and they say, and it's up to the applicant to say it's not within 300 feet of the things, it's in a C2, which is the permitted zone for these, and then so on and so on and so on, and they provide that, and then after review by you know, staff and then the zoning commission and then the city council, they then create a zone change, and this floating zone then lands on Earth and becomes a real zone, and it's specific to that parcel. It's now a CCAN or an ICAN, uh, just that parcel. Okay. Any, any addition, Kevin, to that? Yeah, that's uh, essentially that exactly what uh, Parker said. There is the, you know, the intent here is to create a special zoning designation, not necessarily a district. It doesn't become a zoning district until it's placed on the map. But we're creating this separate zoning designation that will allow for the facilitation of the development of various cannabis facilities. The difference here is that the request to rezone the properties is driven by the development community or by the cannabis community. Uh, but this type of uh, zoning is used very effectively for a lot of things other than cannabis. We didn't just make this up. In fact, the, uh, if you go to the American Planning Association website, you will see tremendous amounts of information, uh, including the legal background, which was, a, all of that was in a first draft of this. I wanted everybody to understand well, that we did have legal standing to create a floating zone. But we also wanted everybody to understand that this is not considered spot zoning. Okay. You've probably heard from you know, time immemorial that you shouldn't spot zone. You shouldn't, it's not something we should do. We need to be orderly and systematic. Well, we're still orderly and systematic about what we're doing, but in this particular case, the responsibility and the burden of proof in order to apply this zone falls on the developer, not on the city itself. Okay, we're all shaking our heads, yes. All right. <laughs> So again, this is something new to, to Roswell Zoning and um, a very interesting way to kind of zero in on, on what, what, where, where these uh, facilities can be. Um, we are creating within um, C1 and 2 and I1 and 2 in air, uh, zoned areas, a C can, which is a commercial cannabis and an ICANN, which is industrial cannabis zoning area. Can we talk a little bit about that? I guess, Kevin. Well, again, we wanted to make sure that there was a distinction, a clear distinction between the uh, requirements for a retail facility. In other words, a place you can go in and buy or consume Good. or hang out, everything else, and the place where places where the more industrial activities are taken, the taking place. So we created two separate uh, dist uh, zoning uh, designations. The CCAN, that'll be our commercial cannabis zone, which will only be allowed within the existing C2 zone. So 
you can look at the entire all the the entire city and again one of we want to make sure that the we fall within the state guidelines so we made it very clear that the c2 zone of all the commercial zones in the city it is the largest zone out there there's going to be there's going to be a number of different locations where they should the developers should be able to find property where they can in fact apply to do the to uh, uh, put an establishment same way with the i2 designation the i2 is the largest industrial designation in in there but we also wanted to make sure that we drove this that the city council had the ability to look at the developments as they come forward. So requiring the zone change, the conditional use permit, the a possibility of development agreements and other things that may be included, uh, the regulatory permit itself, all of that will eventually come forward as a package to the city council. The city council will be the final authority and the final reviewing and approval uh, will be received by the city council for any uh, development from this point forward. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we have a lot of reserved area, which means there will be additional information there that we're not presenting at this time. Uh, also, I think uh, that's important to, to look at is we have listed um, in both the I, I2s and the C2s, um, as well as I1s and and C, I am one is a C1 area. We've got a lot of land use regulations and um, land development standards. So we'll be working on those as we continue. And uh, that will be again on the applicant to produce that information for us. We are prohibiting um, cannabis. What's, what, do I, what word do I want? Cannabis distribution cannabis period I guess is what it is disallowing prohibiting cannabis in um, three of our city districted areas and I think it's important to know well let me say that's the downtown historic district um, the downtown business district and the uh, MRA which is more fondly known as the uh, railroad district, although it's officially a metropolitan redistricting area. And then if you look um, D, we completely added that thanks to some things that we heard at the um, at another meeting, and that is the d that we're, we're saying specifically what can happen out at the air center and that the FAA is primo, basically, mm -hmm. on, on what happens out there. Before, before we can make a decision. So we've added um, that into, the, into that. Um, I don't know, does anybody else, um, Councilor Foster, uh, Mr. Mavers, on page 10, Article 8, we have a spelling issue with the word industrial. And then above that, at the end of section 2767, uh, which is compliance with laws, that last statement says, um, nothing in the chapter shall be construed as authorizing any action while violation, while vi violate, which violate, I'm sorry, state law or local code, I think, not ordinance. Is that, would that be correct, Parker? I've got line 22 on page 10. I think uh, ordinance is a little broader than code because the code would only be those chapters in that are. That are in there now. Okay. Yeah. Ordinances so ordinance is appropriate. I think ordinance is fine there. Great. Yeah, I'm okay, okay with that. Good. Thank you. I beg your pardon? Oh, well, see, it passed <laughs> by me, so what can I say? Um. I, let's move on at, for purposes of right now to page 12. You can see um, there's been the addition of section 27-153, previously approved non-operational non uses. Do you want to address that, please, Mr. Mayors? Or Mr. P Patterson, whichever. 
I'll go ahead and take a stab at this. And Parker, you can help me. Please help me on this one. One of the uh, reasons you have so much, uh, so many changes between last Friday when this was first sent out and today is that we learned so much on Monday and Tuesday. Not the least of which we learned, I believe it was uh, either late Monday afternoon or early Tuesday morning, that we do have a couple of facilities out there that were previously approved by the city for medical cannabis uh, type of uses but they are in the process of building and developing. They have taken our information, our approval, they have applied for their building permits, they have put everything together, but they have yet to receive their regulatory permit from the state. Okay. So we have this gray area. They're technically not an existing non-conforming, an existing use that will be made non-conforming and allowed to continue because they haven't received their final regulatory permit. They have not begun conducting operations. Okay. Parker and I had a pretty extensive conversation about this and we believe that it is in the city's best end. The only, there's only one that has come forward right now and it is a very uh, limited use application for manufacturing of finished products. There will be no retail sales there. They will bring in a product that is in its raw state. They will turn it into some kind of type of finished product whether it's a, uh, an edible or a, uh, um, gummies or something like that, and then they will send it right back out and it will be delivered to the dispensaries for sale. So this is a, a very innocuous use. It will take place all behind closed doors. There will be no uh, public access whatsoever. So we believe that because they have relied on our approval, they have pulled their permits, they do have active building permits, they have taken all their steps to move forward, that it was best that we discussed how we're going to handle this situation uh, under our current ordinance. And that's where previously approved by the city anyway, but not yet operational uses, people that have taken our information and decided to move forward. They've made a significant investment. Uh, they have every intention of operating in the very near future. So we laid out some uh, guidelines basically letting them know that they would have up to six months to continue uh, and finish their uh, tenant improvements or their building improvements to receive their final certificate of occupancy and then an additional six months from the certificate of occupancy to obtain their regulatory permit from the state. And then at that particular time, uh, they must be operational. If they are not operational at the end of that, then unfortunately they fall under new rules and may be subject to reapplying and starting all over thank you parker any i just else? i'll just uh mention that you know from the point of view of the cannabis regulation act these are as uh kevin was saying they don't really fall within that grandfathered in type of scenario because according to the to the legislation uh the local jurisdiction is not able to interfere with or force uh, an existing licensed licensee who has a licensed premises from moving. But in this case, or these types of scenarios, uh, there's not a licensed premises yet, and so there's not the same requirement under state law that we can't interfere with them. And then at the same time, you know, th nobody has a right or a vested interest in a particular zone that they're in, and so the city council has the right to change zones, you know, when they want to, and that's part of the law. However, uh, there is some case law out there and just the basic notion of fairness where we have said, go ahead, you're good to go. And then before they can finish the project, we turn around and pull the rug out from under them and change the zone. That's kind of unfair to them after they put the money in. And so that's the thinking here. And the, there's some law that, you know, basically is kind of basic fairness doctrine that, uh, that applies to this that would support that kind of a distinction. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The other, the other thinking here on this is, had the state not passed their current legislation, they would still be in the same situation. They would still be finishing up their building permits. They would be applying for their medical cannabis regulatory permit, and they would be under operation regardless. Uh, it's only the, the, uh, the fact that the state passed this legislation and they've got an implementation timeline uh, that they've been caught up in this. The, uh, that user has been end user has been caught up in this transition period. Okay. Thank you. All right, I think that pretty well goes through the uh, 
what we we currently have in front of us to make a recommendation to full council. Madam Chair, um, can you look at one thing on that last page before you finish? Are we on section four or wherever? What, is uh, that page on? 14. Okay, please go ahead. I just am confused. I just need some clarification. Sure. On page 13, we end with article 13 taxation, section 27 dash 160 through 27 dash 169 reserved. Then we turn the page and then it starts with section two, section three, section four, section five, section six. It, I can answer that. It, yeah, that, I just need clarification is all I, I need. Sure. Um, what, uh, what I'd like to say, first of all, uh, yeah, is we're following the, the format of how we present an ordinance. And um, I neglected to say earlier, I hope everyone will look at the whereases that we have here that will not actually go into uh, the, the code, but at least explains what we're doing here. If you notice, um, just before the, the heading of Chapter 27, Cannabis, uh, we have Section 1, and that is that, which is a typical standard for, for the drafting of an ordinance, which is uh, that the, the, the code is amended to include Chapter 27. So then you go to the end and you see section two, three, and four of that explanation, I guess. Is that right, Parker? Right, chapter 27 is all section one. And so once chapter 27 oh. is done, now you have section, section two. Now you have two. That, that clarifies. I just d did not catch that from the beginning. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. <laughs> um, we have people in the audience, and we do have time. Uh, it's 4.31, according to my phone. Uh, we do have a 5 o'clock city council meeting scheduled uh, here in this room to, to look at this uh, for one thing. But if there are, is any public comment out there, I'll go ahead and ask for that right now. If you come forward and give us your name and your address for the record. Hello, my name is Jacob Salas. I live in the county. Okay. And uh, I appreciate what you're doing, but I think you're a little prejudiced against me. <laughs> to tell you the truth. Sir, can you speak into oh. the microphone? I'm sorry. I believe you're a little prejudiced against me <laughs> because uh, I've been growing my own medical marijuana for a while now. In fact, I had to give up my gun rights and I had to give up my Alcoholics Anonymous coin because I started using medical marijuana, okay? I love my medical marijuana in my salad. I don't need to smoke it. You know, for those uh, people that don't like the smell, I, I apologize, but I don't like the way a skunk smells either. <laughs> um, but. If you want us to grow indoors or in a greenhouse, I, I really appreciate that. But what I don't have is the funds to do that. In fact, when I started on my medical marijuana, I preferred to grow my own because I don't like the nitrates. I use organics. I don't use any fertilizers other than my animals that I have on premise. Now, anytime I get a male plant that might transfer pollen, I kill it. For respect for Cliff Pirtle, who grew his uh, hemp, industrial hemp. I thought that's what you're referring to. Because I do want to grow industrial hemp called herd and fiber. It has nothing to do with consumption. It deals with construction. I could grow two acres and build a house. That's simple. It uses less water, and this year, if I would have taken out a permit to grow my own plants, I wouldn't have needed to water. As you can tell, out in the county, our weeds are seven feet tall. So those issues are true and valid, but don't be so hasty, because then should I complain about the nitrites in my water from Leprinos, that 400-acre, 30-foot deep pond of, of, of whey? Those are things that affect me and my water. And so I'm, I appreciate that you would be concerned for that. So the issues you're, 
describing here, this is my first meeting. I've been trying to follow this, but you don't have a very good system for allowing the public to know when you're doing this. So I'd appreciate if you'd be a little bit forthright and out in the county when people are doing this, there are plenty of people that were against medical cannabis, against all these other things that are happening now, but yet now they enjoy the idea that my friend's wife with muscular, well, with MS, can now do the product for herself. And he doesn't have to give up his gun rights. All these things are, are big issues because you know what? Security was a big issue in my house and nobody came on my property, nobody, because that was a requirement. I do things legally. I was uh, against all these things because I had issues with the law. And this is what it's doing right here, is telling me that the law is going to be against me if I do anything wrong here and I'll be criminalized. Okay? I appreciate that. But it's really something that we have to take into consideration that there are people out here that need this. Not the, the, the recreational or the medical, but for the assurance that if they have something in their house, they're not going to get a police officer kicking their door down. I don't like that. Never like that. One of my best friend's mother died because he was doing illegal activities and went to visit her and they kicked their door down and she died of a heart attack. So let's try to make this a little bit more non-legalistic, but yet, you know, take all the facts into consideration. I appreciate this. And uh, if we're required to build greenhouses for our plants, I grew four plants one year and I had four pounds of product from those plants. I'm on Social Security and I grow excellent product, excellent. And I burned it because I was told that I could only possess eight ounces. They didn't clarify on your person, but that's what I harvested. And so I burned it because I was afraid that if I had that much, I could be thrown in jail or persecuted for some reason that I don't understand for Mr. Solace, these things. I, I, I greatly appreciate what, what you're saying. Um, let me just clarify right off the bat is uh, what we're talking about today in this particular ordinance will only be in fact, a bit be in effect, effect, effect within the city limits of Roswell, New Mexico. We're not regulating what you're doing out in the county, which brings me to an interesting question that I haven't heard yet as to whether or not the county is, is addressing this issue. Uh, but it's, but that's their, it, that will be their issue. Oh, We're talking okay. about just within the city. But I come into the city. Sure. And, and, and you know but what? But you're not growing within the city No, limits. but I understand, but if I have product on me, and the law is right now that I can give it away to somebody that owns a personal uh, marijuana uh, medical card. I can give it away. Now, if I would have known that I'm then. I'm not familiar, so I'm sorry. I don't Well, know. I'm familiar because I do not want to break laws. I believe in law. I also believe in free enterprise, and I also believe in interstate commerce. So this is what we're, you know, it's the interstate commerce that we have to, you know, address here. So that way we can benefit. I will pay taxes if I can grow it. I, I love the idea that I could earn some money so I could buy my teeth, my dental plan. You know, I, I'm tired of being uh, looked at because of health issues and this and that. Sure. You know, there's a lot of product that can benefit, especially, you know, the teaching to do things a little bit more organically instead of, you know, I understand people want to make money. I just want to survive. You know, my family just had to give me a car because I can't afford to fix my own car. I'd love to be able to buy a new car. 
Mr. Solis, I think we need to stay on topic of, again, the, the city ordinance. Um, yeah, but, okay, that's let me, fine. That's let me just say that as far as you possessing uh, the cannabis products or whatever, that's going to be regulated by the state. The statute specifically says how much uh, you, can, you can have on your person, um, which is nothing no, more no, that's addressing. That's, that's been addressed. Because, because that's done by the state. So we appreciate what you're saying. I would say, first of all, you know, check with the county to see what they're doing with the regulations. And um, again, I don't, I, think, I don't think we're doing anything that's really a whole lot more strict than, than the state statute. We're just trying to implement it here. I, I understand. I, I agree so. with the zoning and I agree with all the things that Thank you're doing. You. And uh, I, I, I support that. I also support that children that don't need it shouldn't get it. And uh, that state statute. It's just like so. my, you know. So let's, you know, yeah, I'll stay on topic. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, issues seem to spread in New Mexico because we're a tight knit community. County and city, it's only you guys that make the separation. It's we that live out here have to depend on each other. Well, that, that's what we do. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's not us that makes the. the no, I'm just saying us as as a, in a general people who make the laws. We vote for people who make the laws. So you know, I see you're you're doing your jobs really well. I read this. I I never would have had this unless I came here. So I'm seeing what's happening, and uh, it's good because it gives us substance where we can have a conversation. And the other thing I'd like to bring out is this is not the final draft. It's still going to go through some other processes. So I appreciate you coming here and, and uh, discussing this with us. We will take into consideration what we can and what we, yep. we have the uh, purview to do. Thank you. Thank you. I'll leave this here because it's your property. Thank you. No, you may take it, certainly take it. But just recognize that it's a draft. It's probably not the final form. Okay, but it gives me it gives me something to share with my friends that are afraid to come to the city and to address these kind of issues because of the stigma attached to the product. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment, Kim? <laughs> I'm saying you're the only public. on. Um, I'm Kim Rutley and I'm the prevention coordinator, substance abuse prevention for Chavez County and we're the only the the only current contract right now, um, sorry, uh, that has a specific to cannabis. Well it's called marijuana in the contract because it's a federal contract from the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. And so um, just some of the things I'm trying to understand, you know, what we can and can't do. Um, I do know what, what some of the models are around the country for, you know, youth prevention. We've seen in policy, I've worked with Judy for, well, 20 years ago, we worked or on more. Roswell's <laughs> Clean Indoor Air Act. Oh, so, we you know, yeah, ago, yeah, she's, she was one of the, uh, the founding mothers, fathers hey. of that. Um, so I appreciate so much um, how much you guys are looking into this and how much consideration you're giving all of the details. It's wonderful. Um, thank you, Kevin, for, for educating me about the policy um, considerations. Um, just a couple of items. Well, there's a few, but um, the infusion of THC into uh, other products. We we're talking about convenience stores. And that's a place, that's a point of sale. So it's a place where youth have gained access to tobacco, alcohol, and other products that are, are not so healthy for them. But um, I talked with Chief Bateman and Hagerman, because we work out in the county as well with prevention. And she, you know, they confiscated um, you know, a kid was walking around, 19-year-old, had $10,000, and then a whole bunch of THC-infused products. So they were like Cheetos, Oreos, um, the, the Sour Patch kind of candies, which the kids love. 
um, and they all had THC in them. So there's a lot of um, concern among um, other stakeholders in the community about youth gaining access to those products. So I don't know, you know, with the state law, if there's anything um, to restrict infusion. They said no alcohol in those, those convenience stores, but other products are allowed while there are uh, THC infused products like that. Um, that kids are getting a hold of, I think, at Roswell or Goddard High. They've already been confiscated by, um, you know, school officials. So that was one thing that um, I didn't hear too much conversation about, but maybe something to think about. Uh, public use being um, illegal. I'm wondering what that's looking like when there, when we do have, um, I guess there's an allowance for like a lounge. Um, a cannabis lounge or something like that. So, um, you know, where will they be able to consume cannabis because the clean indoor air law doesn't allow the use in public places. So um, all of these and then um, the distance uh, from, uh, you know, churches or schools and things like that, we have 300 feet in there. Um, uh, there's another recommendation for a thousand feet from schools, churches, etc. You know, 300 feet is like a close to a 200 meter, so a 300 meter myrtle, hurdle. You know, I'm a track person, so I'm like, okay, that's within eye shot of a school. And you know, where the zone, the commercial zone, is going to end, it's also going to begin on the north side of town where we're really developing businesses and families go to shop and eat and such. So wondering about that and then also south of town where Roswell High is and all the other other uh, places, so um, distances. So the biggest thing that we learned from clean indoor air is fewer kids smoke in a city that's smoke free. And when I started in tobacco control in, in 2001, 36% of our kids smoked. Now that we have clean indoor air, 6% of our kids smoke cigarettes. So environmental, the way the city is set up, the environmental public policy that you set forth has everything to do with, with your young people. So we'll, we'll just be here as a resource. Thank you again so much. I think everybody's doing as much as they can to help our kids, and you can tell your hearts are in it. Um, we are number one in the country for youth marijuana use. And it is affecting our graduation rates and our economy. So we're, we're very concerned about that. But thank you so much. Kim, thank you. Um, what I recall, Kim, let me ask you please, is that you guys were the ones that put out the stickers on the businesses and all that the smoke yeah. free you still have those? Um, we don't have any at, uh, that was at Counseling Associates back then, but now we're at La Casa, like Marty Effort is the right. director there at La Casa, and we are available to uh, print, you know, signs, whatever you guys want in terms of education um, for the public, because here's the bottom line, kids need clear rules. They need clear boundaries. They don't they, they are absolutely confused. We've done a lot of uh, focus group and work with the kids on, on um, cannabis. And the biggest concern for them is if it's legal, it's, it's okay, you know. So um, they're just going to need to know the difference. And it is confusing. This, the state is, you know, we've talked about this. They haven't been real clear. Um, so it is up to us to, to take those steps forward. But yeah, we're totally can, okay. can make signage. To yeah, thank Good you so know. much. Thank you. Okay, um, we're at a point right now, unless it, anyone has more questions or comments, I'd like to um, hear a, a motion on what to do with Ordinance 21-09. Whose turn? Councilor Foster. I don't think our Baptist minister wants to make this uh, <laughs> yeah. motion. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. But okay, I'll make it. Uh, let me actually put my glasses back on. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we send to a full council for advertisement um, ordinance amending the Ros or 
Ordinance 2109, amending the city code to provide the new chapter 27 for commercial cannabis. Second. As, as presented in the... As presented with, revi with the, the revised, revised, revised copy, I guess. Copy of, of 5.2 with also the clerk or the, the inscription errors the revised. The Scribner errors, Scribner I guess. Errors. Second. Uh, or let's just say with the changes made today, they are that not works. all Scribner, I don't think. That works. Okay, we have a motion and a second um, to basically uh, refer, oh, you know what? Did you say public hearing? Okay. Okay. Uh, the motion basically is to um, send a full council to advertise for a public hearing ordinance 21-09 as uh, presented uh, and revised at this meeting uh, with the recommendation to approve. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. And so this will be actually going to council at our meeting in 10 minutes. So thank you all for being here. Uh, appreciate this. Um, we are going to be, as I said, in, t in, in 10 minutes having a special city council meeting where one of the items on the agenda is to advertise this to do a, a public hearing at our August council meeting. So still opportunity to talk and to, to look at this. But here, having no other business for this meeting, I will adjourn the legal committee meeting. Thank you all.